Kevin O'Connor. How's it going, brother? Great, hey, buddy. How you doing? Doing well. So, you like to drink beer. I do. The story is you went to Radford yes. and you didn't want to drink Natty Light, Milwaukee's best. You wanted to be in your apartment or dorm room and, and brew your own. Correct. How did you learn to brew? Uh, well, I could eat up probably 30 minutes about this whole story. <laughs> um, it all started, I hate to say it, and this is not for anybody underage to understand, but I started earlier than that in a always drinking Sierra Nevada and Sam Adams and things like that. Um, it was my freshman year at Radford and I used to drive over to Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, to visit some friends who had a store over there called Vintage Cellar. And I would go in there every Thursday and pick up a bunch of beer. And it was on a fake ID, but at the, <laughs> as I got to know the manager, uh, he didn't call me Brent, my brother, he knew my name, Kevin, and uh, he, He's like, man, I've never seen anybody, uh, a young kid come in here so much and buy such good beer all the time. You're always exploring and you're, you're so into it. And he was the one who actually said, have you ever thought about making your own beer? Of course, I didn't. I said, I don't even, didn't even think you could do that. You know. So long story short, he sold me a homebrew kit and uh, started cooking beer on a hot plate in my dorm room. <laughs> and I almost got thrown out of school for that. So. How, did that how did that beer taste? It was horrible. It was... Uh, <laughs> It's not good. Um, you know, home brewing is a lot of fun, uh, but it's not consistent. And you know, every so often, more so than often, uh, you would have bad batches. So cleanliness is next to godliness with this. So you started the brewery when? In 2010? Uh, 2009, September 2009 is when I signed the lease and started having equipment delivered. Uh, we brewed our first batch St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2010. And in that in-between time, what were you doing to prepare yourself? Um, well, it's funny, you know, I, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, my father was in business um, locally. We had a, a, an auto part chain. I'm not sure if anybody in here remembers Twinbee Auto Parts. Uh, that was my father's company. And uh, so I got to see uh, entrepreneurism at its finest through the good times and the bad um, and get probably some of the best advice and experience from somebody I look up to, my father. Um, he was a very tough man. Um, you know, being my boss, I'm almost 40 years old, so for 40 years I was my boss. Great thing is he's now my CFO, so I'm his boss now, which is a lot of fun. Um, you know, with, with that, and then after he sold the business, uh, you know, I had to find a real job, and um, I ended up, you know, working in the bar, but, you know, being a bartender and serving locally, um, and then jumped into credit card processing, and then I jumped into Cisco Foods. And the great thing is, I didn't, you don't realize it while you're doing it, but everybody I was selling something to was always to the restaurant or I was selling it to the hotelier. So I started making relationships and connections uh, when I was selling credit card processing, and then you know, a year later, I was coming in trying to sell steaks and seafood, I was talking to almost the same people. If not, I knew how to get into the door quickly. Um, after that, um, I didn't bleed Cisco Blue. Um, so I ended up going to work for, I actually quit Cisco to work for St. George Brewing Company over in uh, Hampton. And that was my second brewery job, but I fell back in love with the brewing aspect. And then, um, you know, I kept telling my dad, I, you know, I really want to, I do, I still want to do this, I still want to open a brewery. And uh, he said, don't reinvent the wheel. Maybe you can just buy the company you're working for. Well, that's great coming from somebody who didn't have any money. So, uh, of course, I had to put a business plan together. And uh, so I ran you tried a, buying St. George? Yeah. But sadly, uh, and like anybody, even like with me right now, it, it, running into small business ownership pride, you know, we don't want to sell. And thanks for, you know, for that. Uh, I ended up knowing I was hitting a ceiling in there, I ended up leaving and going to work for a distributor. So I was back out selling beer, uh, which I love. I love so much selling beer. I love talking about beer. I love drinking beer. I love bringing a new customer in and, and, and showing them what we can do and, and, and gaining fans. Um, so that was another aspect of it. So I got to learn the production end. I got to see the paper flow. And then I got to see the, uh, how the distributors work. So coming into my own business, 
again, not really even paying attention to it, I had all that experience and information already readily available for me. So if there's anybody out there trying to start a business, go work for somebody for free, do a side shoot of the business that you want to learn something else about the business. If it's distribution, you know, talk with people like that. And I think that's one of the most important things I've ever learned. Mm-hmm. And uh, I learned that from Damon John of FUBU when I interviewed him last year. And uh, he, I said, if you're gonna give advice to someone who was- The Shark Tank guy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you were thinking about um, starting a business, what would you tell that person? They said, don't quit your job. Yeah. You know, play this game for a little bit and make sure that you actually enjoy it. So you have about 32 years of experience that you've built up into this. You try and buy what now I guess is your competitor, um, but you've, you've learned all of this process along the way. And I was still home rowing every weekend. So. What did your dad teach you from a lesson standpoint when you know, he was going through the, the tough times? What made you want to actually then maybe experience that yourself? There's one thing that I always say, you are always going to misstep. You are always going to fail. It's the true ones, the ones with the passion, the ones with the heart are gonna pick themselves back up and just keep charging. Um, our first brewery on 25th Street, uh, you know, the proverbial 18 hour days were actually true with me. I mean, I wired half that building myself and uh, you know, every once in a while you just get knocked off the ladder and. But you got back up because you know you need to hit a deadline. You've got to brew beer. You can't just keep this going. And uh, so that's one thing that, and if you're going to make a commitment, stick with your commitment. That was one thing my dad always taught me. Um, perseverance is, is, is not, I don't think, learned. I think it's mostly innate in people. But I do believe that if you're passionate about something, you're never going to, you're never going to take no for an answer. You're not going to listen to any naysayers. You're just going to keep pounding the street. You're going to keep doing whatever it takes to make it happen. How much did you start the business for? I was actually probably the cheapest brewery at the time. I started for two hundred thirty-six thousand dollars. And you raised that from a series of investors, or? Uh, loans, uh, family, uh, and then a couple outside of friends and family. That's it. So you. And, and I guess now it's not as bad, but you moved into an area that people would say you shouldn't move into. Right. In your mind, was that ever a risk, and how did you get through that? Uh, well, so when we started, um, there was a Senate bill that we helped pass, Senate Bill 604, which allows for tasting rooms. Um, before that, I just needed industrial property. I didn't really care where it was. I wanted it in close proximity so I could get lunch every once in a while. And then luckily my friends opened up Handsome Biscuit, which completely crushed my physique. Uh, <laughs> but the, and being close to my house, I mean, you know, when there's you know, a bell that goes off or the fire alarm goes off or something like that, I want to be in close proximity. I'm born and raised right here in Norfolk. I love Norfolk. I do say Norfolk. So uh, I'm from here, born here, but I'm a very regional guy. So love the beach too. Got it. We won't talk about it later, bro. Um, we already had. So. Um, so, you thought about expand. So, so business has been good. Yeah. You you built a, a real community around it. Senate Bill six hundred four really reinforced what you wanted to do, and yeah. you, you opened originally to do just distribution. Correct. Right? That's all I had. That's all I could could have done. And then, um, why did you decide? And this question's from Joe Fuller. Um, how did you understand that expansion was that kind of next step, and what? What were the flaws in kind of growing in that? Uh, sadly, um, and again, this is one of those missteps, we got to a point where we were running out of, when, it, when Senate Bill 604 came about, we had to jump on it. Um, we weren't going to let some of my friends in the industry take more advantage of it than us. Uh, we had that little teeny bar in the back. Uh, we were brewing around the clock, and we would squeegee the beer off the floors by 3 o'clock so we could let people in at 4 o'clock. And you were drinking in our shipping lane. Uh, sadly, there was probably rodents running around and things like that, but it was something that what I found amazing that no one seemed to care. It was more of a community, people were coming in. We ran out of sheer volume capacity and we were running out of sheer physical capacity. Just, I mean, people were sitting on the rain bags, people were knocking kegs over. Uh, so we knew at that moment we needed to expand. And with Senate Bill 604, we were, instead of making these every five year expansion plans, we were like, we're gonna do it one big time right now and we're gonna 
pray, pray, pray that this works out. And we went from 5,000 square feet to 35,000 square feet uh, with a system that was three times as much uh, capacity. And just hope that the tasting room would work, and it did, and now we're expanding even more. Did you save a lot of money for that to happen? No, I went out for more investment. Okay. Uh, was there a specific criteria that you were trying to follow to, to hit three times capacity? Yeah, uh, open up more markets. Okay. Yeah. And so when you're, okay, so you're in everywhere in Virginia now, you're the third or fourth most produced beer in Virginia. Yes. Um, what does your sales cycle look like when you're going to this, these different places and trying to get O'Connor's in there? Um, I mean, you're talking about like going into a restaurant yeah. and things like that. So we've employed, we have, well, when we first started, there was just me and uh, a guy named Chris. Uh, now we, have, we employ over 30 people and we have a sales staff now of five, I believe. I just had a meeting with them too, I can't believe. We just hired, that's why, we just hired somebody. Um, that are out there, our feet on the street, trying to make sure our brands are still relevant. Um, volume right now for us is the grocery chains, uh, and we do that at a corporate level now. Uh, so like I was telling you earlier, I was in Charlotte for Harris Teeter, I'm gonna fly to Cincinnati for Kroger. Um, right now, and we've also invested not only in the quality control, but we've also invested into computers, I guess. The, we look at uh, software programs that can look at run rates, we know what we're packing off in 30 to 40 days. We know where it's going, how it's going, uh, what's fresh, what's not. So those are the kind of things that now we're looking at. What was the last thing you cried about? What was the last thing, last thing you cried about? Wow. Can't be like a movie, it's gotta be about this. It can be about a movie. Uh, Beauty and the Beast. I teared up, you know what I did? I teared up with, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Kate McKinnon on Saturday Night Live when she yeah. sang the, uh, I thought she, I thought, yeah, Hollywood, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a really good. So uh, you cried in the last three days? Actually, I was on, it was on, I, I recorded, so it was actually last night. Last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a really good uh, rendition. What, um, what is your favorite beer? What is my favorite beer? That's a hard one. Um, the favorite beer, that I, my go-to beer at the brewery is Right now, actually, it's Backyard Bonfire, our smoked IPA. I drink a lot of El Guapo. Um, but my favorite beer of all time is probably Founders Breakfast Stout. Love that beer. Do or Victory Prima Pills, that's a great everyday beer. And do you make, do you make that, the Founders? Founders is the- Founders at least three. A lot of people say that maybe the uh, beer market is getting saturated mm -hmm. and more breweries are coming in, um, but not every brewery is trying to distribute the way that you are. Correct. Do you think that um, the brewing industry is a bubble, or are there kind of two parts where one is more like a restaurant and one is more for distribution? Uh, I, I, have, I did subscribe to the craft beer bubble theory. Um, it happened in the 90s, uh, and it was basically similar situations during the recession. A lot of engineers that were out of work got into brewing. The difference between then and now is um, there weren't a lot of quality control checks back then. So there's a lot of bad beer out in the market. Um, sadly, what I think, there's so many different aspects that I'm looking at right now um, in the craft beer industry, is when we started, we were, let's call us number 1,000 brewery in America, and there was over 5,000 distributors. Now, no one paid attention. Now there's almost 5,000 breweries, but only 1,000 distributors. So now it's become uh, harder and harder for distribution, to gain distribution, especially for a new brewery. And here's the problem, a lot of people are starting out in the size that I have right now, and I think that's not smart. Um, so I think the people who are opening up small units um, and focusing on tasting room abilities, I think they're gonna be successful, and they're gonna be successful for a while. When did you know for sure you wanted to own your own business? Oh, I knew that at a very young age. Um, so while you were at Radford? No, no, I mean, when I was a kid, that's all. I, mean, I was the kind of kid who said, uh, I'm gonna, I mean, they're gonna take over my dad's business when I'm gonna open up my own business. So it was 1995 when I wanted to open up a brewery. Um, when you hire someone, is it a long process? What is your hiring strategy? Um, there's, I guess, different levels. Um, 
you know, if we need somebody, I hate to say, in the more of a grunt worker, you know, it could be pretty quick. When I'm looking at hiring outside sales reps, um, I look at everything from experience, uh, and you don't have to be in the craft beer industry. I mean, if you've got sales experience, we look at that first, and sadly, I look at Facebook page now. So I don't like seeing people ranting about how bad somebody else's beer is and stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah. So if you're looking for a job, don't post bad things. Well, on like, have you ever heard of Untapped? Yeah. Uh, it's a beer app. You know, you drink, rate it, whatever. Uh, it's a corporate rule in our place that you do not rate other people's beers. How much do you tell your family about the business? Like, how involved are they? Uh, sadly, my wife is in the business. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. Is this reported? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she won't look at it. But, uh, and my father's in the business. Right. So okay, my father's the CFO of my company, and my wife is uh, VP and channels the marketing and events and stuff like that. I mean, if you could do it again, would you not have them involved, or is it a good thing? I think it, uh, it creates a, uh, some stressful pillow talk, I'd say. So, so the question uh, sometimes I, sometimes business doesn't stop sure and that's that can be a problem so with that being said what advice would you give to someone during uh, their perseverance time on how to balance personal life and work life um if you're not in a relationship just kind of keep it easy going if you can so would you tell would you tell penny right that's yeah. right would you tell her everything if she wasn't involved in the business or yeah. would you so what i've learned is um 50% of the people tell their significant others and their families everything. 50% tell them nothing. Well, I don't want to be, I don't want to, excuse my French, I don't want to bitch and complain all the time. Right. You know, it's, yeah, if she was still working, she used to work for American Express in, in you know, when I, and I, when I was doing what I was doing, it was more, she could vent and it was over in 10 minutes. I could vent, it was over in 10 minutes. Now it's, I vent back and forth, back and forth, well into the midnight hours. So. What do you guys vent about? Um, Inventory control issues, uh, paper flow, things like that. Very sexy so, stuff. So, <laughs> so you, you have a lot of waste in your business model. Yes. Um, specifically, some sort of grain. Grain, to, spent grain. Yeah. So how do you incorporate that into your, your business model? Uh, we've partnered with a bunch of farmers. Uh, we have a farmer that uses, we have one farmer who uses it just for organic compost. Uh, then we have another farmer that uses it for chicken feed, and then we have another farmer for more cattle and hog farmer. Can this area be the Napa Valley of beer? We got a long way to go. Like what? Um, Asheville is way ahead of us right now, and Richmond's even is way ahead of us as well. And um, is that just by volume? What is? How do you? I think volume, uh, quality of the products that are around here. I think it, it's going to help with people like Green Flash coming in. Um, you know, beer tourism is huge and it's real, so I think people are now, you know, they're gonna come here and visit family and friends and things like that, but I do believe that they're gonna go around and try things. Um, but I still think, you know, this area being transient in and out, it, it makes it hard for, you know, people to stay stuck on one thing, a few things. When a lot of people fear competition, when a new brewery opens, what goes through your mind? Um, I'm more, I've always been very uh, friendly with all the breweries. Um, it's funny because a lot of them come to me and ask me for advice and they don't take it some of the time, so that's fine. Um, I, I, there's a sense of worry for the new ones, especially in the last year or so. Um, but there's also a sense of excitement for me. Uh, I go around and I drink beers at the other breweries. I'm not there to, um, you know, spy on them. You know, I don't, I don't really look at your recipes, but I'm there to give honest feedback. Um, you know, my friends up in Richmond, they love it when I come in because I'll pick apart a part of beer, and then they win a gold medal. This actually happened. Uh, they won an award, and well, how do you like me now? And I said, I still think it's under card. Yeah, <laughs> not gonna change my opinion. So. so, is there one thing that you think you've grown the most because of? Uh, in terms of. <clears throat> why you're being adopted more than other places? Um, I don't know if it's proven sales, that's what you're looking for, or just, I think people can see the passion on my face. Um, I like, again, I like going out and talking about beer. I think uh, 
you know, sitting down and, and, uh, and, and creating that relationship is, is, is a huge driving force thing for any business. So I think that's why I've grown. When, when did you start incorporating the actual branding into the company? Uh, when we went into Bobbles. Uh, it was very easily, I don't know if everybody remembers the, uh, the first tap panels we had, they were old pieces of wood. You know, those probably cost more money than these custom taps I have now because we were out there, I'd spend all day cutting wood, painting, and stuff like that. So when we finally figured everything out and looked at how we're going to brand different beers, that's, it was really when we started getting a package. We needed to pop. I spend more time at the grocery store staring at other people's package now to find out whether how ours stands out. When you go to the grocery store now and you see someone pull out a six pack of El Guapo, do you smile? I do. Do you go and talk to them? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lifespan of uh, a business's life um, where it's kind of a startup and then it's another stage. Um, how did you know, and maybe you still think you are in the startup stage, but that you needed to act and put processes into place or um, hire a very specific type of person. Where in that stage did you start doing that and how many months into it was it? Um, it was actually a few years into it. Um, it was more, you know, come to the brewery, have fun, brew beer, um, let's see if this works. Uh, I hate to say it like that, but I couldn't think about anything else other than getting the best quality beer out. You know, when we first started and you have a big tank full of beer and the first distributor buys a fifth of it, you freak out. You know, are we ever going to sell beer? Is this really going to work? And then it started working and it, and it started gaining momentum. Um, putting processes in, uh, I can thank my father for this one, uh, and it wasn't for his arrival, it was prior to that we started putting process together, hiring people um, like Hannah from, used to be with Alt Daily. Um, to really help us focus branding and things like that. Uh, with my father now in, in place, more processes came. You know, at the end of the day, people want structure. And you know, when you got a demographic of employment from 21, I'm not the oldest guy in the company anymore, to my dad, you know, everybody needs to know what they're doing. And there needs to be accountability. And, and that's where it was hard prior to the, where we are now. So if it was, I still, always, I'm always gonna think I'm in startup mode. That's, I think that's what keeps me going sure. and keeps me excited about it. When you had that distributor come in and you only sold a fifth, what did you learn from that to make sure that you sold more? I got in my truck and drove around and broke probably every ABC law there was trying to hustle beer. Hashtag hustle city. Uh, uh, I went to, we opened up, when we opened up Richmond, because I thought I needed to to get the volume, uh, that backfired quickly. Um, but I showed up, at an, I have an old forerunner, so if you ever at the brewery, you'll still see it there. Um, and I packed two kegs and a crash box, jockey box that you see at like festivals. And we would pull up, me and the craft manager for Brown Distributing, we would pull up in the back alleys of restaurants and go in and grab the restaurant owner or the bartender and say, hey, you wanna come try some beer? And then open up the door and we had this bar and we would pour beer. And I still get people to this day saying that was the, that is the most memorable experience I ever had. And, with a, with a and they buy your beer. beer. And they buy and, my beer. And I think that's, that's, that's smart. And I think a lot of people would freak out with that, you know, illegal or not. People are afraid to raise their hand. People are afraid to pick up the phone. And that's, that's the same situation. Yeah. It's, I, I want this result. I didn't get it yet. How am I going to achieve it? And it's by... Uh, doing whatever it takes to let people get a little sample of it. You have to. You have to. If someone here today is thinking about throwing in the towel or uh, isn't satisfied with where they are, what would your words of wisdom be? Well, if you put it in a certain situation, I mean, if you've leveraged everything, um, you're in debt up to your eyeballs, I don't know, maybe it's not the right business. But at the end of the day, if it's something you're passionate about and everything is not just going perfectly, but it's almost there, don't give up. I mean, like you said, pick up the phone. Uh, who else can you sell to? I mean, if it's a, if it's a, a tangible product that you, you can sell, there's people who, who want to buy it. Uh, you just got to find those customers. Great. Kevin O'Connor, great job. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. All right.